Hello and welcome uh, back to this uh, 26th lecture on bio microelectromechanical systems. Uh, today, uh, let us just first quickly look into uh, a brief review of the previous lecture. Uh, we started with uh, understanding the basic uh, voltammetric mechanisms like linear sweep and cyclic voltammetry. Again, uh, voltammetry is the technique of measurement of uh, reduction or oxidation potentials of various electrochemical species uh, with rapid voltage scan. Uh, the measurements made are between current and voltage and uh, we basically get a peak uh, which shows whether the electrons have been released or suddenly absorbed at a certain potential corresponding to the oxidation and reduction potential of the species. And then comparison to standards uh, kind of lets us know what uh, the species are or in what concentration they are present. Uh, we also talked uh, briefly about chronoamperometry where uh, we discussed uh, the application of a square wave and uh, going to a certain peak potential which would oxidize or reduce a species and then try to understand the kinetics of uh, decay of the current as we uh, go temporally. Okay. So, various species would have a different rate of oxidation or reduction uh, or in other words various species would have a different rate of release of electrons or absorption of electrons which would make uh, chrono amperometric measurements comparable uh, and uh, would let us draw inferences from uh, the current versus time plot uh, in such situations. Okay, so, we also talked about conductivity sensors. Um, conductivity essentially um, means the inverse of resistivity and uh, uh, the increase or decrease in ions of one kind of a particular species would definitely lead to the increase or decrease in the conductivity. And you can use this uh, measurement technique by assembling together uh, what you know as a Wheatstone bridge. Uh, then we started on new area of uh, some basics in fluid mechanics. Uh, it is very uh, important to mention uh, for me to mention here that because we will be studying some fundamental problems in microfluidics, uh, we need to understand these basics. Okay. So, essentially we covered uh, about uh, what really a fluid is by definition. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, how it would deform on um, a shear force being applied uh, to the system and how it compares with the solid um, uh, in a similar kind of situation. We try to understand what uh, really a continuum is or when it breaks, breaks down particularly at a level when um, you know the dimensions, uh, the spatial dimensions of uh, the, uh, the control volume uh, kind of rhyme with uh, the mean free path of the different molecules. Uh, then we get differences in properties like velocity, density, etc., with time, and that is where the continuum breaks down. Uh, we described in details about velocity fields, uh, we talked about 1, 2 dimensional, 1, 2, and 3 dimensional flows, respectively. And then we also try to categorize um, these very important ways and means of geometrically representing flows uh, by means of timelines, path lines, streak lines, and streamlines. So, we will kind of start uh, from here and then go to the next agenda today which is uh, stress fields. Okay. So, essentially um, you know if you look at really what a stress is, uh, we all uh, know that stresses uh, are force per unit area okay, uh, for basic definition. And so, uh, so typically in, uh, in a continuum fluid mechanics, uh, we have a surface or volume uh, or body forces encountered at different points of the fluid. So, if we consider a control volume somewhere in the fluid, uh, because of the flow motion and there because of the viscos viscosity forces between the different layers, there is a tendency, tendency of these, uh, these forces to affect the surface or the volume as such of that uh, volume element or control volume element. Okay. So, the surface forces uh, act on the boundaries. Um, of, a, of a medium through direct contact, which means that let us say if we consider the fluid as a bulk and it is flowing through a pipe. So, then the border line between the pipe and uh, the fluid is uh, where the surface forces are directly acting and there is an impact of these surface forces through into the bulk of the fluid. And, and also uh, forces develop without physical contact and distributed over the whole volume of the fluids uh, are termed as body forces. Okay. So, essentially it is a volume force that we are referring to. 
So, uh, like for example, gravitational force acting on a fluid element uh, is essentially um, a fluid volume element is essentially a body force. Okay. So, what uh, that is essentially it is rho times of V, uh, V is the control volume times of G. Okay, rho is the density, V is the volume. So, that is uh, making it equal to the mass uh, of a certain control volume and then uh, you have a gravity factor G acting. So, this is a body force. It is uniformly felt over the volume, uh, the whole volume of the control element that we are uh, kind of figuring out. So, here right here as you can see uh, the body force acting on a on an element of volume delta V is also given by rho delta V G and essentially this is nothing but the differential mass here rho delta V times of acceleration due to gravity and so it is felt within the volume. So, let us actually figure out what stress uh, really is in terms of uh, such a control element. It is important or pertinent in fluid mechanics to understand fluid as uh, uh, an assembly of control volume by control volume you know and so therefore if there is one representative control volume in such situations it kind of generically represents the properties related to uh, uh, the flow in general like you know velocity uh, acceleration uh, density uh, so on so forth so the stress in a medium results from forces acting on some portion of the medium okay so definitely there has to be a relative force between this element in consideration and the medium in which this element is uh, for us um, uh, to understand the essence of stress. So, there is a relative force between uh, the control volume and its surrounding medium. The concept of stress provides uh, a convenient means to describe the manner in which forces acting on boundaries of the medium are transmitted. Like let us say for instance, consider a control volume here uh, as in this example you can see this is a control volume okay? and uh, uh, this control volume is essentially close to let us say some point C in space and we consider a small area delta A which is uh, adjacent to this uh, point C uh, inside this control volume this irregular shape at control volume. Now, um, any area as uh, we know from uh, vector geometry can also be represented by a direction perpendicular uh, to the area in question. So, if we are considering this small area element as illustrated here uh, and let us say the value of this area is delta A. So, we can represent this area by a normal vector, a unit normal vector pointing away from uh, this area and perpendicular to the area and we call it delta A vector as in this particular case. Now, let us suppose that uh, there is a force delta F vector which is acting on this area vector delta A. Okay? So, it is at a certain angle uh, in respect to delta A, but then there is a force delta F vector acting on this area vector delta A. So, uh, if we imagine any surface within the, the flowing fluid, uh, uh, this, this surface let us say uh, is, is a part of this whole control volume as has been illustrated here. Okay? And uh, we also assume that this delta F which is at a certain angle with the area vector uh, can be resolved into a normal component which is uh, in the direction of this normal vector. Let us say this is uh, the normal component uh, delta F n okay? direction of the normal vector again uh, and one which is uh, kind of tangential to the area of interest here close to this point C and we call this F tangential, delta F tangential. So, essentially uh, we are kind of resolving this uh, delta F vector into delta F n that means delta F in the normal direction to the area and uh, another component delta F t, delta F uh, tangential to the direction of the area. Okay? The value here for this normal vector is also delta A. And this is the tangential direction represented as T cap, this is uh, the normal direction represented as N cap. Okay? Now, if you want to really see the kind of stresses because of these two components on this area vector A, uh, it would be represented as uh, a normal stress and 
a stress which is tangential, right? Because there are only two components of the forces, the normal force and the tangential force. So, based on this we can define the two different stresses as one in the direction of the normal vector, which is also represented as sigma n or the normal stress or the principal stress and it is can be it can be defined as the limit of the area element delta a n approaching 0 delta f n which is the normal component of the force vector delta f by delta a n and uh, the shear force. So, this is known as this is called the principal stress or uh, the normal stress. Okay. So, this is the normal stress and uh, the other component which is parallel to the area can be represented as tau n limit delta a n tends to 0 delta f t that means the tangential force by delta f a n a n. Okay. So, the area vector still does not uh, uh, is, is unmodified it still remains the same. So, we have a stress due to the normal force uh, parallel to the area vector and a stress due to the tangential force perpendicular to the area vector causing the normal stress and the shear stresses. So, this essentially is how you define normal and shear in uh, such a certain uh, you know situation. Okay. So, normally it is kind of uh, you know customary to consider uh, the vectors or the, the components of uh, these force vectors in orthogonal uh, coordinate system which essentially means. So, in a, in a rectangular coordinates uh, we may consider uh, the stresses acting on planes whose outwardly drawn normals are in the x, y and z direction. Okay. So, essentially if this is a plane that we are talking about okay, in the rectangular coordinate system x, y, z, uh, we consider the stresses acting on planes whose outwardly drawn normals are in the x, y, z direction. So, one of the planes is essentially whose outwardly normal here uh, is drawn in the x direction. I am representing it by this red line here. So, let us call this as uh, some area vector delta a x. Okay. Another would be similarly in the y direction which is probably an element like this which is orthogonal to this uh, a x element and it is called delta a y and similarly delta a z. Okay. Now, if we want to represent uh, uh, the stress vectors here, let us say only on this particular plane here, okay, on this a x vector here. So, let us suppose this is the plane, okay, we we'll just draw it separately here and so you have uh, again uh, components of uh, the force in a rectangular coordinate system well resolved into all the three coordinates x, y and z and let us suppose uh, the force along the x is f x delta okay, along the y is uh, delta f y and along the z is delta f z. So, here as you are seeing there is one principal component. Uh, let us say sigma x x and two shear stresses uh, based on the resolution of the force in the y and the z direction respectively. So, delta, so the principal stress here sigma x x is essentially equal to limit of delta a x tending to 0 delta f x by delta a x okay. and uh, the other two components we represent this as tau x y which means uh, the shear due to a force in the y direction the second term here uh, applied to the area vector a x. Okay. So, the second term of this is the force direction and the first term is the area direction. So, tau is the shear applied due to a force in the y direction by an area vector in the x direction also represented as delta f y by delta a x delta a x tending to 0. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the limit of delta a x and similarly this again is a representation where you are considering tau of x z meaning the shear stress due to a force in the z direction on an area pointing towards the x direction. The second term is the direction of the force in this subscript here and the first term is the direction of the area vector. This is just purely notational and uh, it is needed for kind of uh, understanding uh, the, the different components of the principal and the shear stress 
when this plane changes between let us say a plane pointing to the x direction, a plane pointing to the y direction and the plane pointing to a z direction in a rectangular coordinate system. Okay? So, really if we look at uh, all this together uh, as I pointed out before or illustrated before, there are three such planes in the orthogonal uh, coordinates as you can see here. Uh, there is a plane in the x direction, right? the plane pointing towards the x direction. And if I really make a control volume as I, as I described earlier all fluid mechanics is really about constructing a control volume. So, let us say we make a cube as an element uh, which represents a, a representative control volume. So, in this cube you have a face facing the x direction, a face facing the minus x direction and similarly a face facing the y and minus y and z and minus z directions respectively. So, along all these faces you will have shear stresses. Uh, and uh, at least two components per face and you will also have principal stresses one component and therefore, if you look at all the in totality what are the number of stresses which exist. So, here let us say in the positive uh, x direction if the plane uh, the normal vector of the plane points to the positive x direction you have uh, sigma x x which is essentially the f x that means uh, the delta f x or the force in the x direction divided by the area. Uh, whose vector points towards the x direction that is delta a x. Similarly, you have tau x y as I have defined earlier or tau x z. If you are uh, looking at uh, the y phase that means the phase where the area vector points to the positive y direction, you have again sigma y y in this direction and then you have uh, the shear stress because of the force in the z direction applied to an area vector delta a y pointing in the positive y direction and the shear because of a force in the x direction, uh, a component of the force of uh, which is you know kind of resolved in the x direction uh, divided by the area which is again uh, the area of the face which is having a vector pointing towards the y direction. So, that is what tau uh, y x is and similarly you have a similar combination on the third face here pointing in the positive z direction the area vector points towards the positive z direction where you have sigma z z and two other. Uh, shear stress components tau z x and tau z y. This is very very uh, clearly illustrated here then how uh, you can notationally express these different stresses in such a fluid element. Mind you all these stresses are acting together on the fluid element as fluids go all the way around and past it and uh, there are stresses uh, which can be shear based, there are stresses which can be in the normal uh, direction or principal shear. Uh, principal stresses and uh, th this whole combination is what we have to evaluate dynamically to consider the behavior of such an element with time you know and that, that also leads us to define uh, certain equations of motion of this fluid element as it goes along considering the kinematics and dynamics which we also know as the Navier-Stokes equation. So, in probably the next uh, lecture I would also be uh, trying to derive some of these equations. Um, there are principally three uh, such equations, uh, equation of uh, conservation of mass, uh, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. Okay. So, here if you really put all these stresses together in a matrix form, uh, you can really define a matrix which is also known as a stress matrix, where you have uh, the diagonal elements which are principal uh, stresses sigma in the in the x, y and z direction respectively, sigma x, x, sigma y, y and sigma z, uh, z, z and the non diagonal elements here really represent the different shear stresses uh, as has been illustrated before uh, how these shear stresses come by uh, with a certain notation. Okay. So, this is tau z y, this is tau y z so on so forth. So, uh, the state of stress can really be then described by specifying the stresses acting on the three mutually perpendicular planes of a rectangular coordinate system in, in the orthogonal system at any particular point by uh, this stress matrix, okay, the stress matrix is also known as the stress tensor, okay, of this particular fluid element. So now I would like to uh, kind of uh, go ahead and uh, evaluate the very first, uh, very important property of a fluid, which is viscosity. Okay, so what really is viscosity? So let's see how we can understand this concept of viscosity. Okay. So, let us say we consider the behavior uh, 
of a fluid between two infinite plates. Okay. Let us suppose we have a, an infinite. Now, these plates are essentially uh, infinite in the z direction. Uh, they are in the towards into this particular screen, you know. Uh, so, there is a plate here and then there is a fixed support at the bottom and if you recall, we have done this uh, back um, in lectures related to finding out the parabolic velocity profile, how, you know, uh, a moving plate would influence uh, a, a fluid column uh, by shearing it as the plate moves ahead with respect to a fixed uh, boundary. So, here let us say uh, at time instance t, uh, we have a fluid which was static and having a boundary like this and uh, let us say we apply a force on this particular upper plate in to an extent f x uh, because of which the plate moves with the velocity delta u. Okay. Sorry, let me just uh, delta u is illustrated here. And uh, but let us actually see that uh, if we try to move this with the force of x at, at a rate delta u, what happens after t plus delta t? Okay. So, of course, uh, this plate here would move forward, right? And let us say the new position of this plate is formulated somewhere here because of that movement. So, that it moves in total or in totality uh, by some finite distance here. So, what uh, will you expect uh, would happen to the fluid column? The fluid column would actually try to get sheared like this. Okay. So, as if uh, as, as you know that is how fluid is defined that if you apply a, um, a force in this kind of a situation, the fluid will just simply go uh, or deform plastically and uh, not come back as it happens in solids normally. right? So, in fluid it would just go plastically and stay there and if you apply a little more force it will again bend and keep on shearing as you proceed along. So, here essentially uh, let us assume that uh, we have been able to successfully move this fluid layer by a, a total amount of distance delta L. Okay. So, here one of the elements here as we can see let us mark it as m n o p and this moves to its new position m dash n o p dash. Okay. So, as you may be already aware uh, this particular layer here at the bottom uh, is uh, static because uh, the lower plate is fixed in nature and so there is a uh, a zone of no slip which is formulated and as you go ahead uh, in the y direction you have a velocity gradient which comes up because um, because of this and there are these layers which are kind of she shearing off or sliding over each other as the fluid deforms from the position m n o p to m dash n o p dash okay m n o p uh, here this is m n o p to m dash n o p dash. Okay. So, uh, so let us also assume that uh, the distance between the two plates they are parallel plates and the distance between the two plates is delta y okay. and uh, essentially uh, the total amount of uh, length that this fluid element possesses at the very outset is delta x. So, that does not change much although the shape changes from rectangular into more uh, like a parallelogram okay, because uh, of the shear uh, that uh, the fluid layer would have with respect to the zone of no slip close to the surface N O. So, during the time delta T the amount of distance that has been moved delta L okay, can also be represented as delta u times delta t. All right. 
and uh, essentially uh, the shear stress here T y x that means uh, the stress due to the force along the x direction uh, on the area vector pointing towards the positive y direction. Let us suppose we have a right handed rectangular coordinate system x y z are the different directions. So, the area vector pointing to uh, the y direction is really in this particular direction here and the force is in the x direction. So, that is what would come along this particular plane the m p or m dash p dash whatever you may call. Um, so, therefore, T y x is defined as limit of delta a y give me a minute here. So, limit of delta a y turning to 0 delta f x by delta a y okay? and uh, or d f x by uh, d a y uh, whatever you may call and uh, essentially as we know that from uh, the, the Young's law from the Hooke's law tau x y is also proportional to the rate of uh, angular deformation. Okay. So, let us assume uh, that this angle change here because of the component moving from or the fluid element moving from m n o p to m dash n o p dash is delta alpha okay. and this delta alpha happens in delta t time. So, tau x tau y x is definitely proportional to delta alpha by delta t. Okay. So, the rate of change of angle that is what uh, Hooke's law defines shear stress as. So, if we consider all these uh, factors together, uh, we are left with um, another, another very interesting observation that uh, delta L which is actually this particular element, uh, elemental change in the length or this is the displacement by which the layer M p moves to the new positions M dash p dash as the plate moves ahead uh, is also given by delta L times or delta alpha times of delta y right because this is essentially uh, can be considered in very very small situations as same as the length of the arc that this radius delta y would execute as it moves from position m to m dash. Okay. So, essentially uh, what we are talking about here is the length of the arc delta L uh, by virtue of the fluid element moving from position m p to m dash p dash. Uh, the element moves by an angle delta alpha. So, delta alpha times radius delta y here would define what this delta L is right. So, uh, from so let us call this equation 1, this equation 2 and this equation 3. Uh, if, if you actually correlate equation 1 and 2, you have a situation where delta alpha delta y becomes equal to delta u delta t right and uh, therefore, delta alpha by delta t also becomes equal to delta u by delta y. Okay. So, now as we know that the shear force tau x y really tau y x is really proportional to delta alpha delta t. Uh, so, we can easily say that tau x y also is proportional to delta u by delta y. Okay. Taking limits here, we can get a situation where d alpha by d t uh, is equal to d u by d y. Okay and this is what the velocity gradient is. So, thus the fluid element when subjected to a shear stress tau y x experiences a rate of deformation given by really d u by d y okay? uh, as can be seen in this illustration here. So, these fluids uh, in which uh, this uh, proportionality between shear stress and rate of deformation exists are known as Newtonian fluids as we all know. Okay? So, let us define this again here that in Newtonian fluids and we will in just about a minute see what happens in the non-Newtonian case how that is different in this than this particular illustration. So, in Newtonian fluids the shear stress is also uh, directly proportional to the rate of deformation. As we have illustrated here before 
I just forgot to mention that this, this proportionality only holds valid for Newtonian fluids. That is how the fluids are defined. Okay? So, therefore, in such a situation, uh, we have tau y x is proportional to du by dy and uh, the constant of proportionality in this case uh, is also known as viscosity of the medium mu. So, what really viscosity physically means is that let us say if we consider two different uh, fluids say glycerine and water. Okay? So, we consider two fluids say glycerine and water. So, definitely glycerine is going to resist as, as we all know by a natural experience. The glycerine is going to resist any deformation much more in comparison to water. Okay? So, this definitely is because glycerine is much more viscous or in other words the mu for glycerine is much much higher than mu for water which means that amount of shear stretch which is needed for a certain velocity gradient to be created. Okay? That means you are talking about movement of interlayers. Okay? There are two layers which are moving with respect to each other. So, this, this gradient du by dy uh, for a certain finite gradient to be created we need much more shear stress or much more force or effort in glycerine because mu value is uh, higher in comparison to water. So, that is the essence is what viscosity is all about. Okay? So, dimensionally again if you investigate what viscosity is really you know that uh, stress essentially is force per unit area. So, we can represent that as m l t minus 2 l square by l square. right? So, that is m l minus 1 t minus 2 and uh, uh, du by dy here if you look at really has l t minus 1 by l which has dimensions of t minus 1 and so therefore mu would have uh, units m l minus 1 t minus 2 by t minus 1 or m l minus 1 t minus 1. So, m l uh, minus 1 t minus 1. So, therefore, the units of viscosity is kg per meter second. Okay? that is what viscosity is defined as. So, in, in fluid mechanics we seldom uh, use these units of viscosity, we rather uh, express viscosity as a, as a ratio between the absolute value of the viscosity and the density. We also known as know that uh, better as kinematic uh, viscosity. Okay? So, uh, so, therefore, we can also write here that uh, Kinematic viscosity, the new term which is normally used very often uh, in fluid mechanics, and it, it is very obvious because you know there may be substances where density is higher, okay, and uh, same is the viscosity. So what really matters, and if, if there is a substance which is very very diluted in nature, uh, it it would uh, normally, I mean by intuition we can say that it would have a lower viscosity value. So, what is important to consider in a physical sense is really the ratio between the, the viscosity and the density that gives you a better perspective of uh, the fluid medium that you are investigating. So, kinematic viscosity here therefore is equal to uh, the absolute value of the viscosity divided by the density of the medium. So, I would like to go ahead and uh, do an example problem okay? uh, as you can illustrate here uh, that there is an infinite plate as I just showed and is moved over a second plate which is fixed and on layer of liquid. Okay? So, this essentially is the plate the, uh, the, the semi infinite that means it is infinite in the z direction plate and it is moved over this fixed plate here and uh, for a small gap of width d uh, which is equal to 0.3 mm as you can see here uh, we assume a linear velocity distribution. Okay? So, therefore, the velocity varies from 0 here point of no slip to all the way up to about v equal to 0.3 meters per second which is the maximum velocity of the plate. Uh, 
the the fluid here adjacent to this plate would move at the same velocity because there is another zone of no slip here okay and so there is a relative velocity between the point at the top here and the point at the fixed plate uh, surface at the bottom here so the liquid uh, viscosity which is used here is in this case is uh, 0 0.65 10 to the power minus 3 kg per meter second and the specific gravity uh, is uh, 0 0.88 okay so the specific gravity as we all know is basically uh, how many times the density of water is the density of a particular uh, fluid okay so it's the comparison the ratio comparison between the density of a fluid to density of water uh, at standard conditions so you have to calculate in this case the kinematic viscosity of the liquid uh, you also have to find out what is the shear stress uh, which is generated in this process. Uh, give me a minute here. Uh, so, you have to find out the shear stress on particularly on the lower plate and you have to indicate the directions of each of these shear stresses. So, let us solve this uh, problem to understand about the viscosity. So, the first question is what uh, really is the the kinematic viscosity here as you know uh, kinematic viscosity we call it uh, or we represent it by the symbol nu okay this is really uh, the absolute value of viscosity per unit density density in this case as we know is uh, 0 0.88 times of 1000 kg per meter cube which is the specific uh, which is the density of water at standard conditions so it is 880 kg per meter cube okay and viscosity uh, from our earlier this thing question is given to be 0 0.65 times 10 to the power of minus 3 kg per meter second so nu here therefore would be 0 0.65 10 to the power minus 3 by 880 uh, which is equal to 7.39 10 to the power of minus 7 and the units in this case is uh, 10 to the power of minus 7 okay let me just uh, write this a little more properly here give me a minute so 7.39 times 10 to the power of minus 7 and the units in this case uh, as you can see this unit here is right kg per meter second and this unit being kg per meter cube we are left with meter square per second okay that is what the units of kinematic viscosity is uh, so the second part of the question says what is the shear stress in the lower plate so uh, the shear stress here can be represented uh, as uh, uh, tau again on the lower is uh, mu viscosity times of u by d okay u is essentially 0 0.3 meters per second and d has a dimension 0 0.3 mm so here the total stress would be the viscosity 0 0.65 10 to the power of minus 3 times of the the total velocity here 0 0.3 divided by the distance which is 0 0.3 10 to the power of minus 3 uh, meters okay so it's essentially comes out to be 0 0.650 pascals or newton per meter square that's how uh, you define the shear force on the lower plate about the direction of the shear force uh, if you look at really the plate combination you have this as the upper plate this is the moving fluid okay and this is the fixed plate on the bottom side and you have this velocity vector here going from some finite value u to all the way to zero so you can consider that if this element is moving along with the, the upper plate it would exert a force which is in the reverse direction okay it's a reaction force that it would exert on the on this plate as if it tries to get the plate back into its normal position okay so that's what the upper direction would be uh, simultaneously you are trying to deform the fluid element so it is giving a pressure uh, to this fluid in the other direction here I mean to more towards the movement direction here on the lower plate because uh, it would have been better if this plate would have been able to carry this through along with it but since it is not uh, carrying it therefore the force that is being felt on this 
due to this uh, resisted layer at the at the uh, junction here is actually towards uh, the direction of motion of the upper plate okay so now once uh, we have done newtonian fluids let us actually look into the next a very interesting topic of what really non newtonian fluids are okay so essentially it is again based on this relationship between shear stress and the the velocity uh, gradient uh, in uh, non newtonian fluids just contrary to what the newtonian fluids would uh, show uh, the shear stress is really not directly proportional to the deformation rate okay so essentially for such fluids uh, uh, the you know there are numerous uh, empirical equations which have been proposed to model one of them being the uh, the power law model for uh, describing such fluids and here if you see uh, the the shear stress yx is really proportional to instead of du by dy to the power 1 it is proportional to some n term here where n can be either more than 1 or less than 1 you know and depending on what it is the fluid would vary in its properties or you know physical properties etc so there are different aspects like there is a, a different cases uh, for different values of n for which these uh, 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 this equation would signify a different property altogether of such a fluid. So, let us look them look at them case by case ok. So, essentially what uh, your k here in this particular equation is uh, also this is also known as uh, the consistency index ok. And you can remodify this equation slightly to make it t y x equal to k times of mod d u by d y n minus 1 times of d u by d y ok. This uh, ensures that the tau has the same sign as du by dx and uh, essentially this k times of uh, du by dy mod to the power of n minus 1 this can be represented as uh, the viscosity uh, mu or neta whatever you may call. Uh, so, essentially in this case uh, t y x is becoming uh, is, is equal to a viscosity neta value which varies. Uh, with uh, respect to du by dy to the power n minus 1 with a proportionality constant equal to consistency index k and uh, t tau y x, uh, y x is then related to du by dy by neta du by dy. So, the neta here in this uh, particular expression is also known as the apparent viscosity it is really not the real viscosity. So, if uh, your n minus 1 if, if your n is 0 uh, if your n is 1 really uh, in that case uh, uh, the, the neta comes out to be constant in, in which is the case of Newtonian fluids uh, with time. And if it is uh, more or less than 1 uh, there would be different uh, properties associated with that fluid. So, let us look at the case where uh, this rate is uh, uh, this, this n value is less than 1 ok. So, such fluids are also known as pseudoplastic materials ok. Uh, here the apparent viscosity uh, because n is less than 1 would decrease with increasing deformation. Uh, if you look at this particular equation here n being less than 1 means that this uh, du by dy uh, mod to the power n minus 1 would be uh, essentially uh, a negative quantity ok. The, the exponential here would be or, or the power here would be or the index here would be negative uh, in nature and therefore, any increase in du by dy would essentially mean a decrease in the in the viscosity value ok. So, similarly uh, if n is more than 1 in that case uh, the, the fluids would be categorized as a dilatant ok. And essentially what uh, definitionally that means is that the apparent viscosity would increase with increasing deformation rate. So, if n is more than 1 then the coefficient n minus 1 of du by dy mod which we just saw in the slide back. Uh, uh, would be positive and because of that in this being positive uh, uh, with an increase in du by dy or d alpha by dt uh, the shear stress tau y x would increase because of that ok. So, the, the viscosity mu would be increase because of that uh, viscosity being k times of mod du by dy to the power n minus 1 ok. So, uh, such uh, fluids are known as dilatant. Some examples uh, in case of uh, uh, the first earlier case of pseudoplastics can be polymer solutions which means that with an increase in the velocity gradient that means if you uh, make or stir the polymer more and more uh, the viscosity value kind of decreases uh, because of this stirring action. Uh, some other uh, suspensions could be colloidal suspensions 
or uh, uh, you know paper pulp actually mixed in water uh, where if you uh, move it more and stir it more the viscosity uh, decreases because of that stirring action. Uh, on the other hand uh, there may be these dilatant fluids like starch solution or uh, sand probably where the more and more stirring action would ensure that there is a greater packing uh, between the different grains which would cause the viscosity to go up. So, if the du by dy is more in this case n being greater than 1 then the viscosity mu uh, would go up because of increasing du by dy. Okay. So, that is what a dilatant uh, would be. Uh, there is another case however, uh, which is related to really uh, the way that shear stress would vary uh, uh, and, and how or where uh, up to where which point it would be a solid and then change state. So, it is essentially uh, a kind of material where there is up till a certain shear stress uh, the property is more like a solid and above that cut off shear stress uh, the fluid will behave in a Newtonian manner. So, such fluids are also known as Bingham plastics. Okay. Uh, here uh, the basic equation to represent tau x y would be in terms of some uh, you know some kind of intercept value tau y up to which the fluid behaves as if it were just a normal solid uh, beyond which uh, it would also have this mu p du by dy uh, component which is uh, related to how a, a fluid really looks like. So, this fluid behaves as a solid until a minimum yield stress is attained let us say tau y and then after it is exceeded it starts subsequently exhibiting a, a linear relationship between stress and rate of deformation which is same as a Newtonian fluid. Okay. So, this is referred to as an ideal or Bingham plastic. So, let us actually see what these some of these uh, uh, would look like on a scale uh, of shear stress versus uh, viscosity or shear stress versus uh, uh, the deformation rate du by dy. So, if you really uh, try to draw uh, you know a pseudo plastic a dilatant and Newtonian uh, kind of fluid on a scale of apparent viscosity versus uh, deformation rate du by dy as can be seen here apparently. Uh, the Newtonian fluid is one where this uh, would be a constant uh, parallel to the x axis uh, which indicates that there is a constant apparent viscosity irrespective of whatever the du by dy is or whatever the velocity gradient is. And uh, the case of pseudo plastic uh, as we know it is a material where if the du by dy increases because n being less than 1 the, uh, the, the apparent viscosity should come down because of that okay. the index being negative if you may remember. So, this is essentially what a pseudo plastic would behave like. So, if deformation increases the apparent viscosity comes down and for a dilatant it is the opposite behavior. So, if as the deformation rate increases in that case uh, the apparent viscosity goes up. So, that is what a dilatant essentially uh, would mean. Okay. So, this is a pseudo plastic where the viscosity apparent viscosity falls down the deformation rate a dilatant where it goes up with the deformation rate and a Newtonian fluid where the viscosity actually is constant. Uh, with the increase in deformation rate. So, if you have uh, similar kind of materials or elements plotted on a scale of shear stress tau y versus deformation rate. Uh, so, the Bingham plastic thing can be accommodated here as you see here uh, the Bingham plastic really definitionally is something which would be acting like a solid up to a certain yield stress tau y. Okay. So, this is the yield stress the intercept tau y after which it would start behaving as if it were a Newtonian uh, fluid. Okay. So, here in this range uh, the deformation rate is really proportional to the shear stress after this intercept stress or the yield stress has been crossed over. For a pseudo plastic material uh, with an increase in the deformation rate of course, because as, as you see here uh, the apparent viscosity kind of goes down uh, you know with increase in deformation rate initially uh, there is there is an increase in the in the shear stress up to a point after which it kind of you know um, again uh, starts uh, becoming um, you know kind of asymptotic to a certain uh, value. So, for a dilatant as you see the behavior is thus the opposite way that means you know it kind of increasingly uh, goes on adding up uh, the shear stress and one of the reasons why uh, these, these pseudo plastics and dilatant behave in this manner that if you may remember for a pseudo plastic. Uh, the mu the viscosity is really equal to the consistency index times of du by dy to the power of n minus 1 okay, uh, times of du and, and so 
uh, where for a pseudo plastic as you know the n is less than 1 and for a dilatant it is more than 1. So, in one case as you are seeing the viscosity is going up right and uh, continuously in another case the apparent viscosity is coming down. But as uh, you plot the shear stress, the shear stress tau x y really would be uh, proportional or it will be equal to this k times of uh, du by dy mod to the power of n minus 1 times of du by dy which means that if uh, there is an increase in shear stress tau x y because of an increase in du by dy in both the cases. But uh, as the du by dy increases in case 1 that means in case of pseudo plastic the viscosity comes down with time okay. And so therefore, there is an instance or there is a cutoff uh, deformation rate beyond which uh, the viscosity factor starts outweighing really. So, the lessening of the viscosity kind of outweighs the increase in the du by dy okay. And so therefore, it kind of uh, stabilizes to a certain value and uh, then falls down beyond it. And in the case of a dilatant it is the opposite effect because there is an add on and so therefore, the du by dy to the power n minus 1 component kind of starts dominating after a while and it further increases uh, the shear stress value. In case of a Newtonian fluid though as the viscosity is constant we would expect, uh, we would expect a linear behavior between uh, the shear stress tau y and the deformation rate du by dy okay. So, in, in non Newtonian fluids uh, situation is further complicated by the fact uh, that the apparent viscosity may be time dependent. Some of these fluids are also known as thixotropic uh, fluids where we show typically a decrease uh, in, in the viscosity uh, value with time under a constant uh, uh, applied shear stress okay. So, uh, essentially uh, thixotropic fluids uh, uh, may pose a situation where uh, with time you may feel that uh, just temporally the viscosity changes I mean decreases uh, after uh, some uh, uh, maybe with or without deformation okay. Sometimes uh, so if it is with deformation uh, the viscosity is changing it may be classified as a rather a pseudo plastic fluid. But uh, if suppose uh, you just keep something like let us say glass and beyond a certain thing you see beyond a certain time you see it kind of deforms and shears out and uh, you know uh, slowly the viscosity decreases with time. So, that that can be categorized as a thixotropic uh, fluid okay. So, basically in a nutshell uh, you know uh, you can describe uh, fluid flow to be either viscous or inviscid. Uh, these concepts are very very important at this stage as I again would like to reiterate that because in case of micro scale uh, flows uh, typically all fluids. So, basically the whole idea is that you know fluid flow can be really divided into viscous and inviscid domains. Again I would like to reiterate that these concepts are very very important for particularly micro scale flows because uh, essentially um, all micro scale uh, flows have uh, very prominent viscous uh, forces and effects okay which makes this flow behave uh, flows behave totally differently than the macro scale counterpart. So, intuitively whatever you think about uh, would normally happen to a set of fluids and mac mic macro scale can really not be translated to the micron size uh, scale or micron uh, scale transport. So, uh, so effectively uh, you can categorize uh, viscous and inviscid flows essentially as uh, flows in which the effects of viscosity are, neg are, are either felt or neglected okay. Uh, ones in which it is neglected is known as inviscid. So, viscosity is assumed there to be typically 0. Uh, this is really not a real world situation, but as I will illustrate in just in a little bit how uh, the viscosity can be taken uh, as 0 you know especially in macro scale whenever there is let us say a fluid layer which is approaching a fixed plate. We might have a zone or a domain where we can treat the viscosity safely as, as you know 0. Uh, so, it is more an approximation uh, than an ideal situation okay more an approximation than an ideal situation. So, uh, so normally although they do not exist uh, in nature I mean with 0 viscosity particularly. However, uh, in certain engineering applications they, the viscosity can be small enough to be neglected. One such application is uh, flow over an infinite plane as you can look at in this particular illustration. So, let us suppose you have this fixed plane here which is uh, represented by uh, this, this surface O x okay. and this is also in the x direction uh, of 
O x. So, here as you see uh, you know the flow approaching the plate is, is of uniform velocity let us say u infinity. Okay. So, there is a, a certain flow which is approaching which has a velocity u infinity. So, uh, so the flow uh, when it approaches uh, we are first probably interested in getting a, a true picture, okay, a qualitative picture of what would happen uh, uh, to the flow when it starts just uh, about entering the zone where there is a fixed plate at the bottom. So, so let us say we have two locations along this plate x 1 and x 2 at points a and a dash respectively where we are trying to investigate what uh, kind of behavior will be expected. Okay. So, we have x 1 and x 2 and uh, we, we start uh, let us say at point x 1 here by labeling uh, the y coordinates at which the velocity is known and then ultimately plotting uh, the velocity as a function of uh, or, or in the y direction uh, you are plotting the x velocity magnitude as it moves from x 1 all the way to let us say the point B here. Okay. So, as we know that very close to the plate uh, we have a no slip condition or a no slip zone where typically the velocity is 0 as indicated in this particular region. Okay. So, there is a case of no uh, or, or 0 velocity or no slip in this particular region. And uh, what really would be the effect of fluids which are close to this particular point. So, there the effect. Uh, that the plate should have on fluid adjacent to it is just that of retarding the fluid in the neighborhood of the plate. So, it has viscous forces. Now, at a location B which is sufficiently away uh, far away from the plate the flow will never be influenced okay, by this particular uh, no slip layer because the velocity has already attained a certain value E infinity beyond that. So, this particular region uh, we can actually kind of approximate as an inviscid region. Okay, where the viscous effects are not felt. So, velocity here irrespective of the fact that the plate is close by uh, has already attained the u infinity magnitude and are all same. So, that is what an inquisit flow would typically look like in a physical situation. So, I would like to uh, continue a little more of this discussion in probably the next lecture uh, we are uh, kind of closing on to the time here. So, next uh, topic uh, that I would illustrate would define uh, these things in a little uh, better manner and try to develop a physical understanding as to how the flow develops or what is the layer which separates from uh, the, the, the fully developed flow from uh, the developing flow. Okay. So, I will do that analysis in the next lecture. Thank you.